Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, my name is Lewis, and I'm one of the Prod Product Tank Nairobi organizers. And for those who are new to Product Tank, uh, Product Tank is a local meetup for product people and by product people. So it was founded back in 2020 in London, and uh, today it spans over 185 cities, and Nairobi is one of them. It's made up of product managers, designers, developers, and anyone interested basically in building products. And what happens is we normally come every single month to come together and share our experiences. Um, so maybe a, a little couple of house rules. Um, so please, if you have any questions for Clement, leave your questions in the chat and please make sure that you've switched uh, the tab for everyone and he'll answer them at the end of the session. And don't worry, uh, we are recording this session, so we'll send it to you immediately after this webinar. So over to you, uh, Clement, uh, take it away. Okay, great. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Clement. I'm really excited to be chatting with you today about how product managers are also products. Um, so before we go ahead and jump all the way in, first I wanted to give a quick overview of where we're going to go um, in the next hour or so. So first, um, let me just go ahead and introduce myself. Um, then I want to talk a little bit more about what the value of a product manager is. Why is it that we exist and what is the value that we serve in the world? Then from there, I want to go ahead and talk through how do organizations think about hiring product managers as well as what is the pain that you're solving as a product manager so that you can go ahead and demonstrate that product market fit and understand how you want to grow your product roadmap in the long run. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, I'm Clement. Um, one of my personal missions is to really make other people's lives easier, happier, and better. And so originally when I graduated, uh, I studied business and biology, which I realized is not a typical combination. And through there, I basically became a management consultant. Then I became a product analyst. And then I fell into product management by accident. Currently, um, I'm a product manager at Blend. It's a fintech uh, organization based in San Francisco, where we're basically making consumer finance better for everyone. And so I'm currently leading some new business initiatives there, um, breaking into totally new verticals with our products. Um, you can always find me on LinkedIn at the link over there. Um, on top of that, I'm also a writer for a different community called Product Manager HQ. So I've written about 60 plus articles there. Um, I'm continuing to write about one per month. So before we go ahead and go into this talk, I did wanna at least share that I recently published a book called Breaking Into Product Management. And so for those, uh, those attendees today who are not yet product managers, um, you know, I highly recommend reading through this book. Um, it basically compiles you know, some set of that 60 articles that I mentioned, and I'll also cover a lot of the things that we go through in today's talk in a lot more detail. Um, so again, you'll have access to the slides as well as access to the recording later. Um, feel free to check it out. Uh, we do strongly believe that this will help you break in because we'll give you a clear sense of what does the day-to-day -day of a product manager look like? You know, how do you write a really compelling resume? How do you actually attract the attention of an employer, et cetera? Again, some of which we'll cover in today's talk. Great. So I want to talk a little bit about what the value of a product manager is, a little bit from a more theoretical perspective, since I think a lot of times kind of we all get really deep in the weeds of, oh, well, this product manager does this thing, and that's a little bit different from what that other person's doing. And so I want to step back and understand a framework for how we can all think about product management. And so first, let's talk about a world where product managers don't exist. There are really three groups of people. The first group of people is down here, users and customers. Basically, they're people who have these pains that are in the world, but they don't really know how to solve it on their own. And on top of that, you know, they're really willing to pay money or time to get those pains solved. But again, they don't currently have a way to solve them. Then the second group in the world is called the business. And so basically this business, what they want to do is they want to be able to create a profitable venture so that they can create value for shareholders. And on top of that, so that they can go ahead and continue to keep people uh, well employed. And then finally, you have the uh, developers. And so the way I think about developers are they are both engineers and designers. And basically this development team, they're really interested in really two things. One is that they really want to build really cool things, but on top of that, they also want to build something that is actually feasible, something that will scale. And so in a world without product managers, these three groups fight a lot. So as you can imagine, when a customer is talking to a business, 
the customer is going to tell the business, well, I want this thing that you're not currently selling, or they'll say, oh, well, I don't want to buy it at that price. And so there's a lot of conflict between customers and businesses and businesses fight a lot with customers because businesses will try to sell things that customers don't actually need. Then on top of that, customers and developers also fight a ton without any sort of product manager. And the reason is because customers will say, no, I need it to be built this specific way. I need a blue button on this screen. It has to be in this position without really understanding what it means to build that out. And developers will say, no, 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 that's not what you want. You want, to, you want this thing, let me build this really cool thing. And they'll find out that, wait, there are no customers who actually want to use this really cool thing that we built. And then finally, developers and business folks um, struggle a lot too, because businesses are always saying, ship more, ship more, ship more. We want to be able to create as many products as possible so that we can go ahead and sell all of them. And developers are like, no, 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 hold on. I want to go ahead and refactor all of the code so that the architecture is robust. I want to be able to do a full redesign so that everything is in sync. And so again, these two groups are always fighting. And so what's amazing is that a product is something that successfully solves the pain of all three of these groups. So basically, a product that is successful will solve the pain of a customer while ensuring that a business can be profitable and is also something that developers, again, engineers and designers, are both excited to build and are also able to maintain in the long run. But the thing is, the product, all it does is does the bare minimum, right? Like it just keeps customers barely happy and businesses barely profitable and developers barely excited. And so there's still all of this white space. There's all of this other stuff that can be done. How do we further evolve the product? How do we enable it to go to market better? And that's really where the product manager comes in. So you can see here that the product manager is really filling the space in between users, in between the business and in between developers. And on top of that, they're also always building out the product. And so that's really how I like to think about product management. And that's really important because the key thing to keep in mind is that product managers, because of the different environments that they work in, every product manager is different, right? So even here at Blend, you know, we have more than 20 product managers here. Every single one of us is really different because we serve totally different products. We serve totally different customers and we also serve totally different development teams. So as an example, one of the data product managers here at Blend their end user is really customer side analysts and our API product manager here is really looking at customer side developers. Whereas our mobile product manager here is looking at, you know, loan officers um, who are working on the product itself. And so again, kind of, there's so many different kinds of products that exist. So many different pains that might exist that every product manager works somewhat differently, but really the core theme is that a product manager is trying to bridge the gap between customers, businesses, and developers by pulling together a product that satisfies all of their needs. And so again, because the product manager is the one who's filling the space, you can also think of them themselves as products too. So now I want to dive into, you know, why do businesses ever hire product managers in the first place? And really, there are really only two reasons. And this comes from my own experience as both, you know, someone who's hired other product managers, as well as someone who has been on the other side of that fence too. Right. And so really there are only two reasons. The very first reason is this organization can no longer grow without more bandwidth. Right. And this can apply in, you know, in kind of any maturity of the company. So let's say that we're talking about, you know, a two person startup. Maybe those two founders are no longer able to do customer research. They're no longer able to work on, you know, what, what is it that we should build? They're no longer able to work through all these different things. They're out of bandwidth. And so they might hire their very first product manager um, so that they are able to get more bandwidth. And for a really large organization, for example, Google, they also need to keep hiring more product managers because they cannot do any more with their current bandwidth, right? So one core reason why you might want to hire a product manager is you want, quote unquote, more of the same. You want to be able to have you want to be able to offload your current work that no one else in the organization can currently do because everyone's too busy, right? So basically you want to be able to grow bandwidth. There's a second reason why you want to hire a product manager and it's that you need completely different skill sets from what you currently have, right? And so for example, um, when I was brought on to, you know, one of the organizations as a product manager, um, they were looking for someone who knows how to break into totally new industries because that's just the thing that they never did before. And so again, kind of, you might want to bring in a product manager to be able to tackle totally new things. 
um, one of the things that we recently did here um, at Blend is we brought in a platform product manager because we're hoping to break into this totally new developer space that we just don't have experience with before. And so we explicitly went out to find someone who had built a bunch of platforms in the past, right? If neither of these two reasons exist, organizations don't want to hire product managers. Why is that? It's because jobs are really expensive, right? So there are a couple of things that make jobs expensive. First off, you need to go ahead and write the job description. Then you need to go recruit for that person. Then you have to go and try to figure out who to hire. You have to worry about whether you have to fire them. You have to figure out how to manage them. You have to pay them. There are all these HR benefits. And so jobs are really expensive. And so most organizations would much prefer not to create a job if they can handle the problem themselves. The reason why they need to hire someone is because either, again, they don't have enough bandwidth to grow or they have some totally new set of skills that they just don't have and they need to go find it, right? And that's really important to keep in mind because it really depends on the type of organization that you're targeting. If you're targeting an organization who wants more of the same, it's really important for you to understand what is same. Like what are the types of skills that they currently value so that you can demonstrate to them that you will unlock more bandwidth for them. Whereas on the flip side, if you're being brought into an organization who's looking for something completely different, then you need to demonstrate that you have that set of skill sets that they want that they don't currently have, right? And so again, just taking it all the way back up to the top, organizations hire product managers, not because they want product managers, it's because they have a deep pain. Again, organizations are you know, customers themselves and they're looking for someone to be able to solve this pain. They didn't create jobs just so that someone could have it, they created jobs because they have an unsolvable pain that they need someone to go tackle. And it's one of two flavors, it's either we need more of what we already have, or we need something totally different. And it's really important that you find out which one it is because that completely changes the way in which kind of you approach the, um, you approach the organization. And so I also want to go ahead and you know, dive into a different topic of, hey, well, given that there are all these different organizations who have all these different pains, what if I just send a bunch of applications out, right? Like what if I apply to a hundred companies at once? Is that a good idea? And personally, I think that's a really terrible idea. The reason why is because organizations pick the best product managers available. Again, when you think about it, when a customer is selecting a product, they're not selecting the bare minimum, right? Like even if a customer has, let's say some request for proposal where they have some sort of bare minimum, if they can find something that is even better, why wouldn't they take that one, right? And so the thing is, customers are always looking for the best possible return on investment, ROI, which is simply benefits divided by costs, right? And so because of that, if you just send out a bunch of applications without being really thoughtful about what is the pain that I'm trying to solve, you're going to be beaten by a candidate who does, right? The thing is, if I apply to 100 companies and I only fit them 80% of the time on average, that's a lot worse than if I focused on just five companies and I had 95% fit. Because let's say that for all 100 of those companies that I'm 80% fit, there's someone else who's 90% fit or higher. I'm going to lose every single time, right? But if I focus on those five companies and really make sure that I am a 95% fit with them or a 97% fit or a 99% fit, I'm much more likely to make it to the finish line, right? So one of the things to keep in mind is product management is not a volume game. Like you don't just go out there and apply to a bunch of companies at once. You need to be really targeted about what is the pain that I'm trying to solve. And again, I think this is very much a parallel to building products because when you build a product, you're not just trying to get random people to use your product. You're trying to solve a real pain. You're trying to solve a targeted customer segment. And so again, I think there are a lot of parallels between products and product managers here. And that really informs how you should think about how should I approach an organization to understand what their pain is. And so again, be targeted, just make sure that you take the time to do it right. I realized that in the next couple of slides that I go through, I'm going to be talking about a lot of work that people don't usually do. And it's really scary to do all of that work because what if it doesn't pay out? But the thing is, the other thing to keep in mind is, well, if you don't do that work, it's still not going to pay out because there's someone else who's going to do the work. They're going to be a much better product than you are, and they're going to take the job and you won't get it. So again, it's really scary to invest so much time in, but if you're really interested in being a product manager, or if you are already a product manager and you're really interested in going after a specific organization, take the time to do it right. Don't do it randomly. Don't send out a bunch of applications. 
And so I think that brings us to the next point of, okay, well, yes, organizations have pain. Let's say that I do want to focus on a specific organization's pain. Well, how do I find it, right? Because it's not like I get to talk to everyone there, right? Like, how would I actually understand what their pain is? And the way that I like to think about it is basically, let's go ahead and use your existing product manager toolkit. Let's act as a user researcher, right? So as a user researcher, one of the things that you can always do is really understand the context of that customer, right? So you can do a lot of really great research on the day-to-day -day life of an organization with very public materials. You can always go to the company website to really understand how they position themselves, what they think they do within the company, uh, sorry, what they think they do within the industry. You can look at their job postings to understand what are all of the different pains that they have? Is there a theme across all of these pains? You can always look at their social media to understand kind of what are the net new things that they're doing. You can always look at their press releases to understand how they think about the, their position within the uh, competitive landscape, right? And then on top of that, you can always do demographic studies, which is when I think about demographics, I think about, well, what do populations look like? And companies themselves are also populations, right? Like an industry is simply a collection of companies. And so if you know what industry you're looking at, for example, you're looking at FinTech or you're looking at construction or you're looking at retail, you can always dive into that industry to understand the pains of that industry because the pains of that industry will invariably apply to the pains of that company too. So you can always go look at conferences. You can always go look at white papers, news articles, et cetera. And then finally, of course, one of the most critical toolkits of any user researcher is interviews, which is go ahead and reach out to existing employees who are working at that company. Well, okay, Clement, you say, that all sounds great and good, but I don't know how to talk to existing employees because I've reached out with cold emails and they're not responding. And that's a great question. I think one of the challenges is when people reach out to try to interview existing employees, they don't understand that even right there in that moment, that existing employee has their own set of pains. And so if you cannot demonstrate that you're going to solve their pain, they don't have the time to talk to you, right? So I think there are a couple of things to think about when you're reaching out to ask someone to be able to sit down with them for a coffee chat. First, you really need to help them understand why they should take the time to talk to you, right? Because again, employees are human beings. And so they are already, one, busy with their own work, and two, busy with their own personal lives. And so for them to take on the additional burden of talking with you really means that you have to demonstrate to them what your value is. And so you'll want to tell them you know, stuff about, you know, how'd you find them? Why are they interesting to you? And how are you going to make them feel good? Like, are you going to give them a gift card? Are you going to you know, buy their coffee? Um, or are you just going to you know, really make them feel like they've been a mentor to you throughout your journey into product, right? So part one is really understanding what is the value that you can bring to this existing employee? The second thing is when you're talking to them, don't try to sell them on, I wanna join this company, right? Because the thing is, if you do that, they're just gonna say, well, go talk to the recruiter because that's the recruiter's job. That's not my job, right? The goal is not to sell yourself as a product. The goal is to do customer interviews. The goal is to really conduct research when you're first reaching out to understand what is the pain of an organization, right? And so I think one of the things that people get confused is they try to take all of these steps at once where they try to both conduct research and try to sell themselves in the same shot. And that's just not a good use of people's time because recruiters are so different from hiring managers who are so different from existing employees, right? So you really want to focus on I just want to better understand the company. I want to better understand what pains you're currently facing because I want to understand whether I can fix it for you, right? And so again, it's how can you compensate them for their time? One of the things that you can do is say, look, I'm really interested in understanding how your company runs because I'm really interested in potentially solving this for you, but I'm not here to sell you on hiring me. I'm here to just understand and listen what it is that you do day to day. I'm really interested in you as a human being. I'm really interested because I found that you're doing these really cool things and I just think it's so cool. I just want to be a part of it right? You want to make them feel good. And then as a part of that customer interview, you need to be really clear about what are the learning objectives of the interview, right? What is the pain that this specific person faces day to day? What pain does their manager face day to day? And what pain does their organization face? And the thing is, everyone kind of knows these things as an employee, right? Like they already know kind of what their top priorities are, what their manager's priorities are, what their organization is trying to do. And a lot of the time, this information is not public, right? This information is not part of company press releases, as an example. And so you really want to focus on what is the information that I can get from this person 
that I can't get anywhere else? How do I really richly understand the pain of this specific person so that um, we are able to uh, make sure that they succeed, right? Sorry, one sec. Um, so there's that. And so again, kind of in the way in which you reach out to existing employees, think about how you're going to solve their pain. I think one of the most critical themes about being a product manager is you're always in service of others. You're always trying to serve and solve other people's pain. And if you ever try to do anything for yourself, it's just not going to work because that's not your job. Your job is to help all of these people be able to coordinate with each other to drive value that they couldn't do on their own. Right? So again, really think deeply about how do I reach out to people who already work there so that I can understand their pain not because I want them to hire me, but because I want to understand how to solve their pain. If I can solve their pain, they're going to hire me naturally, right? Like they're not going to hire me just because I asked them to hire me. They're going to hire me because I solved their pain and I can't solve their pain unless I understand what the pain is. So let's say that you've done all this research, right? Like you've read all of your articles, you've gone to all these conferences, you've chatted with a bunch of people within the company. Let's go ahead and compile all of this together because you need to be really crisp and synthesized when you do your go to market, right? Like you can't just say a bunch of random stuff. You need to be really synthesized. And so first off, you need to understand what is the pain that the organization faces? Which of the two was it that we were talking about before? Do they need more of the same skill set or do they need a new skill set? Because that informs your go to market for this one specific organization that you're going after. If they need more of the same, then what you need to do is you need to understand, well, what are the skills, experiences, and traits that this organization really values? What, what is valuable in terms of the sameness that this organization wants more of, right? Who is a good person that I should be like so that you can study them and understand how can I be more like them for this organization? And if this organization is looking for a totally new set of skills, then you really need to understand, well, okay, which skill set are they missing? And on top of that, why do they need these skill sets? Because the thing is, maybe you don't necessarily have the exact skill that they're looking for, but if you understand what their pain is, you might be able to bring a different set of skills that can solve that pain, right? So even if a company says, oh, well, I specifically want someone who understands how to use both Figma and Sketch, maybe you don't have those experiences, but maybe you have really great experiences in working on prototypes and wireframes in general. And so maybe you don't need to no Figma and Sketch, you can solve the pain of, look, I'm a very design-oriented product manager. I know how to work with designers. Don't worry about it, right? And so you need to understand why they want those skill sets, not just what skill sets they want. And on top of that, where are they currently looking, right? Like, are they currently looking at other companies? Are they currently looking at schools? Are they looking at meetups like um, Product Tank? Where are employers looking for these new skill sets? Because you're going to want to be there so that they can find you in the places where they're looking. Great, so now we understand that, again, product managers are products, and that for you to succeed, you need to have product market fit. We talked about the market, right? So we talked about, oh, the employer is a customer with a pain, so we understand the market, but now we need to understand the product, and that's you. You as a product, you have a value proposition. And so a value prop is simply some set of benefits with some set of costs, and so therefore, you have a return on investment, which is your benefit divided by your cost. So as you decide to reach out to this employer, you need to understand, well, okay, well, what are the benefits that I have and what are the costs that I would incur on this employer so that you finally understand one thing, which is, am I a better ROI than my competitors? Because again, if your competitors are higher ROI than you are, then the company is going to hire them. And if, you, if you're higher ROI than everyone else, the company is going to hire you. There's no such thing as minimum requirements the minimum is not enough. You have to be the best because companies are always looking for the best product, the best ROI to solve their pain. There's no reason that they should pick anything lower than that because if they do, they put all of their employees at risk, they put all of their customers at risk, they put all of their shareholders at risk. Companies are always looking for the best. And so you have to decide, how am I going to be the best for this company by understanding what are my benefits, what are my costs, and how do I increase my benefits or reduce my costs so that I'm continuously the best versus all of my competitors? So again, com companies just pick the organized, you know, companies just pick products with the highest ROI. That's it, right? If they think you're the best, they will hire you. End of story. And if they don't think you're the best, they'll pick someone else who is the best. So I realized I talked about benefits and costs, but 
what are those, right? Like, what is my benefit? What is my cost? And that's a great question. In terms of benefits, there's only one single benefit that matters to that company, and it's how well do you solve their pain, right? So it doesn't matter how low your costs are if you don't solve their pain, right? So if, let's say, you really, really, really understand this industry, this company, this segment, this particular problem space that they're trying to solve, your benefit is gigantic, your costs basically don't matter, right? Because that company wants you so much because you're such an expert, right? And so because of that, then your costs don't matter. So the benefits that are most crucial is how well do I solve this specific pain of theirs? Then in terms of costs, I've gone ahead and prioritized costs here. I'm gonna talk about them a little bit each. So basically, the first one is culture risk. It's, am I gonna be a fit with the people within this company? And that's why it's really risky. It's really hard to know for a company, are they going to be able to hire someone who's gonna be a people fit? Because again, you have to remember, product managers work with people. You're working with customers and business people and developers. And so if you can't get along well with their people, they just can't bring you on. Like you just have to be good with the type of people that they work with. Then the second type of cost is a skills risk, right? So there are interviews, sure, but no one actually knows what your skills are until you join them on the job. And so the more you can reduce your risk of skills by demonstrating that you have these skills, the better. So for example, um, if you already have articles or portfolios or case studies that demonstrate that you know how to do the thing that they're looking for, then that makes you much less risky in terms of skills because they know that you have a proven track record. On the flip side, if you've never done those things before, then the company now has a really big perceived risk of, well, I don't know, like, I don't think this person can do the thing that I need them to do, right? The third risk is reputational risk. So again, because hiring is a human decision, if someone, someone has to put their reputation on the line, right? So a recruiter and a hiring manager, when they say, I want to hire this person, they're basically saying, I think this person is good enough. And if they're not good enough, that reflects poorly on me, right? And so one of the things that comes up, as much as I hate to say it, is, you know, reputation matters. And so coming from a really strong school, having a really strong track record, having a lot of recommendations from other people really helps to reduce the reputational risk, right? So maybe you're a good fit and maybe you have really good skills, but if no one knows that they can trust you, then they're just going to take someone else. The fourth cost is time cost, which is basically how long does it take for them to onboard you before you become productive, right? Because the thing is, time is money. And so if companies need to spend a ton of time to try to onboard you and to try to train you, then that's time that they could have been spending doing something else. And so time cost is really critical. And then the least important one is financial cost, which is, you know, how much do you cost in terms of salary or wages? And so one of the things that I find a lot is people reach out to me and say, hey, Clement, I want to work for you for free. Because I think that, you know, I want to be able to learn all these things. And what I tell them is, well, look, financial cost is not what I care about the most. First off, I don't know whether you're going to work with the people. Second off, I don't know if you have the skills. You're explicitly telling me that you're trying to learn skills. And so you don't have the skills yet. And third off, my reputation's on the line. And fourth off, I have to train you. You're too expensive, right? Like you provide not enough benefit. And I don't really care about your financial cost because that's not the most critical cost, right? So I see a lot of people reach out and say, well, I want to volunteer for this company. And a lot of times that's just not an effective strategy. A much more effective strategy is to understand how can you solve their pain? And once you understand how you can solve their pain, then address, am I going to be a good fit with these people? Do I have the skills, right? How do I make sure that people aren't putting their reputation on the line? And how do I minimize the amount of time that they need to onboard me? And then the financial cost is like the very, very last thing that they care about right? So that is your value proposition. And that really helps you understand how you are going to shine versus your competitors. Again, a lot of your competitors, they're thinking about their financial cost. They're not thinking about their time cost or their reputational risk or their skills risk or their culture risk. And a lot of times your competitors, they're thinking about, well, how do I get this job? And again, the point is not to get the job. The point is to solve the pain because if you can solve the pain, you'll get the job. Whereas if you're trying to get the job, you might not be solving the pain. Great. So we've now talked about you as a product and we've talked about employers as markets. Now, how do you get these two things to fit? Well, one of the things to keep in mind is there's no such thing as products that are universally good. You only have products that fit well with their markets. So some examples, and I realize these are kind of trivial, right? Or hilarious. 
Snapchat isn't something that grandparents use, right? Snapchat is something that, you know, much younger people use. Um, Salesforce is a CRM that's typically an enterprise CRM. It doesn't typically work very well with tiny startups of maybe one pe person, five people. And credit cards, you know, they might be in a lot of geographies, but they don't work well in all geographies, right? For example, in China, there's just not that much uses of credit cards. And so the thing is, there is no such thing as a universally successful product. And that's really important because that means that there are no universally good product managers either. And you'll say, well, that doesn't sound right. There are some product managers who are just better. And I would challenge that because one of the things that, you know, let's say is, let's say we think about the most famous product manager out there, right? Like I'm just going to make up someone. Let's say that I'm talking about the head of Google search, right? Google search is an amazing product, right? Fantastic. Whoever is running Google search, that product manager, they have to be really, really good at AB testing. They have to be really good at analytics. They have to be really good at tech because they have to be able to, you know, make it run really performantly, ensure that they're serving up the best possible results. And that's great. But what if you take this product manager and you put them into a very small B2B SaaS startup in business to business, you don't get to do AB testing because you have too few customers right? You don't get to have a lot of quantitative data. You have to do a lot more sales. You have to do a lot more, you know, exploration and joint build. You don't get to AB test, right? Like you don't get to release experiments. And so that Google search product manager might not do very well in a B2B environment. And so the thing is, there's just no such thing as a universally good product manager. They're only product managers who are really good fits, right? And again, I think that's a really encouraging thing for you to keep in mind because that means that let's say that you and some employer just didn't work out. It's not your fault and it's not their fault. It's just, you didn't find the fit yet, right? So there's that. And so, okay, now we understand how fit works. But the thing is markets don't understand what fit is unless you broadcast a signal for them to understand, oh, well, I potentially could be a fit, right? How do you broadcast that signal? You can do that through resumes. You can do that through portfolios. You can do that through meetings. And the thing is, well, that's a lot of stuff. Like, how do I know which one to use? The thing to keep in mind is again, you should always be thinking about the customer because you are a product manager and you are a product. You're trying to solve their pain. And so you need to understand how do these organizations look for a signal, right? And so there are some really funny real life examples of companies finding their product managers in really weird places, right? You know, I have some friends who were hired into their organizations because they just happened to be active on Twitter and that hiring manager saw them on Twitter and said, wow, this is a really insightful person. I want to work with them, right? There are some people who answer really amazing questions on Quora. And then other people who are looking at Quora are like, oh, I should hire them because they know how to do this thing, right? At, you know, there are a lot of different parties, whether they're like alumni organizations or whatever. And co-founders might find a product manager or like a head of product might find someone and decide, oh, well, this is a good person to work with, right? And so the thing is, you just need to understand where organizations are looking so that you show up there, right? Like you don't want to try to do a thing that organizations aren't doing because they won't standardize to you. You need to standardize to them, right? Because they're your customer, right? And so the thing is what I see a lot of times is people might send in resumes and think, Oh, I'm done. I sent in my resume. But the thing is, typically organizations might have thousands of resumes, right? So, you know, I know organizations that might get, you know, a hundred thousand applications within a single year, your resume does not broadcast a significant enough signal. So where are their recruiters going? Where are their hiring managers going? And how do you get in front of them so that you can share that really strong signal of, Hey, I am potentially a really great fit for you. Right? So again, you want to think like the hiring manager, you want to think like the hiring organization, you need to think like your customer does. So say that you jump through all of these hoops, right? You've done all of these things and finally, finally, finally got an interview. One of the biggest mistakes that I see during the interview is that people think of themselves as candidates. They think, oh, I need to say the right thing. I need to shake their hand really well. I need to smile and look at them in the eyes. I need to make sure that I don't stumble and my math needs to be good. Look, candidates, when they approach interviews, they approach interviews with fear because they think, oh, I'm really worried about getting this job. And the thing is, that's not the right way to, to approach it. The right way to approach it is to think of yourself as a product. You are worth something, no matter what. The open question is whether you can solve this organization's pain. And there's no problem if you can't, but you really want to understand if you could, right? And so you want to work alongside the interviewer to help them find a solution to their pain. 
when you serve them, when you demonstrate that you're thinking like self, selflessly on their behalf, when you are doing everything to make them succeed, they are far more likely to hire you, right? Because again, if you can solve an organization's pain, then they will hire you, right? If you're just trying to be a perfect candidate, they don't still understand whether you're going to solve their pain. So stop worrying about, oh, did I use the right word? Like, did I sequence this thing correctly? It's just work with them as a customer to understand how can I solve your pain today, right? And so then that means that when you go into interviews, you go in with a lot more confidence. You understand that you have worth and you're not worried about, well, what question are they going to ask me and how do I make sure I don't mess up? You're really focused on, let's work on this problem together. I want to solve your pain. When you put yourself in service to them, they are more likely to perceive you as a good fit. Okay. So again, if you think of yourself as a candidate, you're going to experience fear. And that means that you're no longer trying to solve that organization's pain. You're too busy worrying about whether you look good or not. And that just doesn't matter. A product has an innate strength as an innate worth. And so you want to bring that worth to the table and let the organization decide, do I think this is something that will help me solve my pain? Well, what if I get rejected? Well, the thing is, one of the most beautiful things about product is products get rejected all of the time, right? Again, there are so many successful products out there, let's say Slack, let's say Zoom, where they're just people who won't use it, right? And that's okay. All you have to do is iterate, right? Learn from why you got rejected. Because again, rejection doesn't mean that you are not good. It just means that you didn't fit that customer. And so you just need to understand, well, why didn't we have a fit, right? Is it that that customer doesn't understand the value that I'm providing? Or is it that maybe the value that I'm providing just doesn't fit this type of customer? So for example, one of the things that I used to do is I used to position myself as a business to consumer product manager, right? But back then, I didn't have that much analytical capabilities. I wasn't very quantitative. I couldn't really run A-B tests. And so the thing is, a lot of consumer organizations said, well, we don't really see the fit here. And so what I notice is I am a much better business to business candidate because I'm much better at working through change management. I'm a lot better at talking with customer executives directly, working alongside the customer's users rather than trying to run experiments and kind of looking at the data to figure that part out, right? And so like that is where I was strong. And so that's how I position myself differently, right? So again, you just because you fail doesn't mean that it's bad. You can go ahead and learn from that failure and iterate yourself towards success in the exact same way that you would iterate a product towards success, right? I think one of the most beautiful things is past performance doesn't indicate future performance. Even if you fail 10 times, that doesn't mean that you're not going to succeed the 11th time, right? Because every customer has a different set of pains and they have a different set of needs. And so maybe that organization that wants you is still out there and you just haven't found them yet, right? Similarly, I see that there are many product managers out there who are overconfident, who say, well, I was so easily hired as a product manager, it's going to be so easy for me to become another one at a different company. And that's not necessarily true because maybe they just accidentally hit that fit early on. And when they reach out to other companies, maybe they won't have that fit, right? So again, products are always changing. Markets are always changing. You need to iterate yourself into product market fit based on the failures that you experience. Failure is completely acceptable. In fact, you need to have failure if you want to be able to iterate towards fit. You need to learn from failure or else you're never going to be able to find what is the unique pain that I can solve in the world? How do I solve pain in the world so that I can make other people's lives better as a product manager, right? So again, you want to iterate towards fitting your market. So let's say that you've successfully become a product manager. Product managers have roadmaps because similarly, you know, products have roadmaps, right? And so I think that's a really beautiful thing to think about because there's no such thing as, there's no such thing as, you know, perfect products, right? No perfect products exist. So all products have roadmaps. So similarly, product managers must also have roadmaps. And so what's a roadmap? right? A roadmap has a starting point and an ending point, And then you have to draw the line from start to finish, right? Great. Well, I know where I'm starting as a product manager, but where should I go? Right? Because I can't draw that roadmap unless I know where I want to go. Great. Well, if you want to know where to go, you should think like a product manager who is trying to mature their product. You are trying to break into a totally new market and that new market has a new set of pains. 
And so you need to think about what are the new sets of pains that I'm trying to target so that I can work backward from there and build that into my roadmap, right? So again, what is the new market that I want to target? What are those pains? Can I address them now? And if not, how will I address them, right? How will I be able to gain those skills? And then roadmaps all have ROIs, right? So the problem is there are some things that are just easier to learn and there are just some things that are harder to learn, right? And so I think a lot of, a lot of product managers, they will tell me, Clement, I want to learn Python. I want to learn SQL. I want to learn Java. I want to be half an engineer. And it's, look, that might be right, but you never asked your customer whether they need you to be more like an engineer. Maybe you have a totally different type of pain that you're trying to solve that you don't know about, right? And the thing is, if you want to become an engineer, that takes a lot of time to learn, right? Like, is there a lower cost, higher benefit alternative that you can take, right? The other thing is, do some of these capabilities together enable you to unlock multiplicative returns, right? Maybe if you learn how to learn faster, and maybe if you learn public speaking, these are all really good skill sets to have, no matter what organization you're headed towards, right? So really think about what are the pains that I'm trying to solve and what are the different capabilities? How much will it cost me to take on those capabilities? And what is the benefit I can get? Do those benefits interact with each other so I can get more benefit out of them? And how do I sequence it, right? So how do I make sure that I set up the right path to success? Because there are infinite skill sets to learn and you don't have infinite time. So you need to find out what is the right sequence of how much time should I invest in gaining these skill sets? What is the sequence that I should take to create the most impact in the least time? So again, the core theme here, I know that I talked really in detail, but the core theme here is don't try to pick up skill sets based on what you think you should do. Don't do it based on what other people tell you to do. Do it because you understand what market you're trying to target, right? And so again, I see a lot of aspiring product managers say, I want to learn SQL. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with the learning SQL. It's just, are you sure that SQL is the highest ROI thing you can learn? And is that what your customer actually needs from you, right? So again, really think about what is the customer's need and what is the highest ROI that I can get by learning these skills. And so I realized I covered a ton of material, but just to summarize all of it again, the most successful product managers think of themselves as products, right? They're always looking for what is the market that I'm trying to attack? They're really trying to understand in that market, what is the pain that I'm trying to solve? Then they try to create a value proposition that will really resonate. They try to create the most benefits possible at the least cost possible so that they can always beat out their competitors so that customers will select them. And once they have the value proposition, they know how to broadcast the signal in whatever method to get the attention of their targeted customers, right? Just because you have value doesn't mean that other people know you have value unless you tell them you have value. And on top of that, even if they fail, they will continue to iterate. They'll continue to grow through a roadmap, through iteration, so that they continue to provide more and more value over their life. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and jump into Q&A. Um, give me just one second here. Let me just go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Clement, for taking your time to taking us through that um, topic. And uh, just to jump in quickly at the Q&A. Uh, so I had the first question and mm -hmm. uh, it was in regards to so you mentioned about product market fit. So my question is, what growth hacks could I use to test if I've actually achieved a product market fit from your experience? And what kind of experiments can I run to actually confirm that I've actually achieved it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And so again, you'll want to use your skill sets as a product manager to basically draw a parallel. So a lot of times product managers have, um, you know, what they'll do is they'll do some sort of demand testing through user testing, right? They'll say, oh, I have a prototype. I want to walk you, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, through this prototype, and I want you to tell me kind of, do you see value in this, right? And so similarly, the nice thing is that coffee chats themselves, when you are, um, you know, when you are uh, reaching out to employees, if you understand their pain deep enough, that is where you can go ahead and consider doing that test, right? It's, you wanna reach out to people who are not the recruiter, who are not the hiring manager, 
and get them to, you know, you want to see, do they see your product market fit? And if they see it, then that's a pretty good indicator that the organization will likely see it too. And that's great because you haven't submitted a resume yet. You haven't created a cover letter yet. You haven't needed to do anything, but talk to someone and pitch them on, do you think that I am a good fit for your organization? Do you perceive that I solve your pain? And if they're really, really excited to refer you, take the referral, right? Because the thing is, when someone refers you to their company, what they're saying is, look, don't worry about the reputational risk. I vouch for this person. I think this person probably has cultural fit. I think they probably have skills fit. I'm willing to back this person, right? And so one of the most effective things you can do is once you're confident that you are ready to begin your growth hack experiments, once you are certain about how you want to pitch yourself, reach out to some employee at that organization, not the recruiter, not the hiring manager, because you don't want to use up those shots in a low risk way. See if you can get on someone's radar and convince them to do a referral on your behalf. And if they're not willing to, then you know you have a problem, right? You know that they're not excited enough about you. They don't understand the value in you, right? Because the thing is, again, employees themselves, they're motivated in many different ways to bring in people to solve pain. The first way that they're incentivized is having more employees at the company who are tackling pain means that they don't have to do, go deal with that pain, right? It makes their life easier. And on top of that, a lot of companies have referral bonuses. And so if they're the ones who refer you and then you get hired, they actually get compensation for that. And so they're really excited to be able to do that, but only if you don't risk their reputation. And the best way for you to not risk their reputation is if you're a good fit. And so a really great growth hack, again, is reach out to existing employees, ask to understand what their pains are, and then pitch them on, well, based on that you have these pains, here are my skill sets. Here's how I fit your company. Here's how I, I think about solving your pain. Is that something that you'd be interested in moving forward with? Would you be comfortable referring me for this role? Because I think I can solve the pain. And that's a really cheap growth hack to use. It only costs you a little bit of time. All you have to do is reach out to that person, convince them that you know, they should chat with you, and then talk with them. And that's it. And you can do that as many times as you want within that organization. Of course, provided the organization is large enough, as long as you don't touch the recruiter and you don't touch the hiring manager, because you don't want them to render a formal decision on you because then you can't recover from that, right? So reach out to an existing employee and run your growth hack that way. Cool, thank you. Um, Amos has asked a question. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle a situation where your ROI is low, but for a company that offers you an opportunity to challenge yourself? That's a great question. And so I think, how do I phrase this? ROI comes in many different ways, right? And so one of the things that companies look for, which you might not actually realize, is companies are willing to take a risk if they feel that you can close the risk very quickly, right? And so one of your potential ROIs, one of your potential benefits is I can learn super quickly, right? And so as an example, right? Like, I became a product manager at a real estate brokerage, but I had no real estate background. As a reminder, I had a major in molecular and cell biology, right? Like cell biology is not what a real estate brokerage is looking for. But what I was able to convince them of is I learned very quickly. And so I presented them with all of these different uh, narratives of look at how I learned so quickly about breaking to this initiative for this customer of mine back when I used to be a consultant. Right? Like I'm learning super quickly. And so you don't need to worry about me not understanding real estate. You don't need to worry about me not understanding, you know, your internal employees or your customers, because look at all the things that I've done as a consultant to be able to close the knowledge gap really quickly, to be able to close the relationship gap really quickly, to be able to close the skills gap really quickly. Right. And so that made me so much less risky for that particular employer. And they saw the benefit was, Oh, I can shape this person however I want whatever I tell this person to do, they're going to learn it and they're going to figure it out themselves. Right. And that is a really amazing benefit that I think a lot of people don't have. Right. I think a lot of people, when they apply to an organization, they say, well, here are my current skill sets set in stone. Right. The thing is when you sell yourself as a product, you don't just sell yourself on your current skill sets. You're also selling people on your roadmap. How fast do you learn? How dedicated are you? Right. Like how much grit do you have to power through all these really difficult challenges? And that itself is a benefit that other people might not have even if your costs may seem high, even if you may not have quote unquote relevant experience, it doesn't matter if you don't have relevant experience, if you can pick up that experience super quickly on the job. But again, that's hard because now you need to prove to them that you do know how to pick that up super quickly. And so that means that, you know, let's say maybe I'm a designer. 
right? And I'm a designer and I want to become a product analyst or product manager or anything, right? And they say, well, I don't think you would know how to do that because you're a designer. And now you have to have really clear stories of, well, look, I know how to, be I became a designer this fast by doing X, Y, Z. I learned how to break into, you know, I learned how to understand this user persona this fast because ABC. I learned how our entire product ecosystem works and how our design architecture works so fast because X, Y, Z. And this is how much time it saved my employer. And this is the type of value that I bring. And so I'm going to learn your stuff really fast too. And so that is not a risk to you. That's actually a benefit. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to combine uh, two questions, mm -hmm. and uh, this is from James and Eric. So it, the first one is, should I create a pro prototype when trying to prove my product market fitness with the organization? And also, how do you actually present that prototype if you're not technical, and uh, you're rather if you don't have a technical background? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I think one of the things to keep in mind is there are a lot of different kinds of prototypes that exist, right? Like just because within product management, we use the word prototype to mean something that you can click through, it doesn't mean that you have to code anything. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a portfolio, right? Maybe all you have is a case study. So one of the things that I've seen before is I see product managers who will write a case study of something that they've done before, or I'll see them do a breakdown of, hey, here's how a competitor's feature works, here's why it's good, here's why it's bad, and here's what I think your company should do. Basically, if you can demonstrate that you have these skill sets, it doesn't matter what the form factor is. It doesn't have to be a clickable prototype. You don't have to be an engineer. All you have to do is know how to communicate, right? And so again, can you provide a really clear case of, I know how to solve your pain? And that can come in many different ways. Maybe that comes in an article that you publish. Maybe that comes in some interview or some speaker talk that you give, right? Maybe that comes within your resume where you're really clearly demonstrating that you know how to solve their pain. It doesn't have to be a clickable prototype, right? So when I say you want to iterate towards product market fit and you don't want to like build the whole product before you try to get product market fit, I don't necessarily mean that you have to build a website. Like you don't have to build a website. You don't have to build a clickable prototype. Like that's not the point. The point is how do you do something that is low risk and low cost to your time that demonstrates to that person that you will likely be a fit, right? So again, I'm a huge fan of coffee chats because those are typically pretty low risk. I'm also a huge fan of writing because that really documents for everyone who might see you later, oh, this is how this person thinks. This is how this person breaks down these types of problems, right? And so I would say some of the cheapest prototypes you can make is look at a feature either that that company has or that the competitor has or whatever and break it down. Why was it built? kind of what was it built for? Who is it targeting? What could it be doing better? Um, what did it do well, right? And like, how should the company respond to all of these uh, different pieces of information? Kind of how will you take the company further based on your understanding of all these different things, right? So do case studies beforehand because that is a good way for you to practice the types of things that you're going to want a solution for when you're within the interview itself. Cool. Thank you. Now, tying to what you mentioned about uh, having coffee chats instead of showing case in your portfolio. So how important is this portfolio in regards to showing your product market fitness? Yeah, great question. Um, so in terms of a portfolio, right, I think portfolios come in many different ways, right? So one of the things that, you know, I'll personally say, so I've written more than 60 articles on product management, and I've also written a book on product management, right? And so that is part of my portfolio, right? But I don't have any sort of case studies where I show people, oh, this is the specific product that I built because I don't want to break any of my NDAs or any of my contracts, right? And so again, like portfolios don't need to be something that is something that you've actually done. It can always be a display of the skills that you have, right? I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, to have a portfolio, I need to have built a product. And you don't necessarily have to, right? Kind of almost anything is part of a portfolio, right? Again any sort of insight that you can bring to some team, any sort of documentation that you can provide that like I've, I've been able to pick up these skills are all valuable additions to some portfolio that you might have, again, to be able to demonstrate that product market fit. Because again, taking it all the way back up to the top, employers don't actually care what's in your resume or what's in your portfolio or what's in your cover letter. They don't actually care about anything outside of, do you solve my pain? 
And there are a lot of different ways for you to demonstrate to them that you solve their pain, right? Again, maybe you meet your employer at a bar um, on accident, right? And you somehow convince them that you are the best person for the job. They're going to hire you without looking at your resume, without looking at your cover letter, and without looking at your portfolio. Resumes, cover letters, portfolios are not necessary and they are not sufficient to get you a job as a product manager. The only thing that matters, can you solve the employer's pain and can you convince the employer that you do solve their pain? And so a resume and a portfolio and a cover letter and a meeting, all of those are simply ways to demonstrate that you do, but you don't have to use any single one of them. You don't have to use any combination of them. You just have to demonstrate, can I solve their pain, right? So I think based on the questions I'm hearing uh, tonight, there are a lot of concerns around, well, I don't have a portfolio. I don't have a prototype. That's not the point. The point is, how do you demonstrate your fit as a product? And the best way to do that is to first understand what is the pain of that employer and then convince the employer, whether it's verbally, whether it's through articles, whether it's through case studies, whether it's through whatever, demonstrate to them that you understand how to solve their pain. That's it. That's the only thing that matters. Cool. Give me one second. Okay. Yep, and maybe on the last question, on the final question is still on a right. Amos is asking, in terms of the cost aspect, what is the difference between skill and reputation risk? And if both points um, have a proven track record of your work, you as an individual? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so I think, how do I phrase this? There are a lot of companies who like to use kind of different indicators that are not necessarily skills-based to understand whether you'll be a fit, right? So I know that here within the United States, a lot of employers like to use Ivy League, um, like to use kind of Ivy League degrees, right? Like if you graduated from Harvard or if you graduated from let's say Stanford or MIT or whatever, then you are much less of a reputational risk. Or if someone writes you a really great uh, recommendation letter, you're less of a reputational risk. If all of your friends are vouching for you, or if someone, if a close friend of that employer tells the employer, hey, I think Clement's a really good fit, right? Then that makes your reputation a lot less, even if they have no idea about how your skills work, right? And so I would say that reputational risk is a kind of, is a very related, but distinct risk from skills risk. Because skills risk is specifically, do you have the specific track record of doing this specific set of work, right? So. For example, for me, I'm currently leading new business initiatives. And so the skills risk is, well, do we believe that Clement knows how to break into new industries? And the way in which I mitigate that is I demonstrate a track record of working in previous organizations to break into those new industries. But in terms of reputational risk, the open question is, well, do we feel that you know, this person is someone that we can trust? And so because I graduated from UC Berkeley, because I have you know, a 3.94 GPA, because I have a bunch of recommendations, because I've written a bunch of articles, my reputation is so much higher, even if they don't yet have a really good indicator of what my skills are. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of breaking those two apart. Cool. Thank you. Um, now we are wrapping up um, the session. Um, so thank you, Clement, very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, we're looking forward, of course, to the additional resources that you're going to share with us. And also, guys, at the end of the session, or rather at the end of this talk, we shall share with you the video and also these slides that we're going to set up on SlideShare. So thank you guys for coming. And if you have more questions, you can actually join our Kaizala group or even just go on LinkedIn and ask Clement anything for clarification.